a spring night, a large room of an old house. A middle-aged woman, dressed in black, is speaking to a young man. They have not put on any lights. Through the two windows, a merciless light enters. I've neglected to say that the woman in black has published two or three interesting collections of poetry of a religious nature. Well, the woman in black is speaking to the young man. Let me come with you. What a moon tonight. The moon is good to me. You can't tell my hair has turned white. The moon will make my hair golden again. You won't be able to tell the difference. Let me come with you. When there's a moon, the shadows in the house grow larger. Invisible hands draw the curtains. A ghostly finger writes forgotten words in the dust on the piano. I don't want to hear them. Be still. Let me come with you. A little ways down, as far as the brick factory's low wall, there, where the road turns, and you can see the cement, yet airy city, whitewashed with moonlight, so indifferent and immaterial, so positive, like metaphysics, that at last you believe you exist and do not exist, that you have never existed, that neither time nor its ravaging ever existed. Let me come with you. Oh, 
smile on that low wall. There, on that height, and as the spring wind blows about us, we may even imagine that we're flying, robbed in the haze and glory of such a moonlight. And many a young man, even more handsome than you, have I sacrificed to him. Because many times, even now, I hear my dress rustling like the flapping of two strong wings beating the air. And when you enclose yourself within that sound of flying and you feel that your throat, your ribs, your flesh have grown firm and thus tightly wedged within the muscles of blue air, within the vigorous nerves of those heights, it doesn't matter whether you go or come back nor does it matter that my hair has turned white. This is not my sorrow. My sorrow is that my heart also has not turned white. Let me come with you. I know that every human being goes his own way towards love, alone towards glory and towards death. I know this, I've tried it, it doesn't help. Let me come with you. This house has become haunted. It repels me. I mean to say, it's grown very old. Its nails are falling out. Its picture frames tumble down as easily as though plunging through a void. Its plaster falls as noiselessly as the hat of a dead man from a peg in a dark corridor. As the worn woolen glove from the knee of silence or a strip of moonlight on the old gutted armchair. Even it was new once. No, not the photographs you're looking at so incredulously. I'm speaking of the armchair, very restful, where you could sit for hours on end and with closed eyes dream of any random thing, of smooth, sandy beaches, wet, polished by the moon. Even more highly polished than the old patent leather shoes I send every month to the corner shoe stand, or the sail of a fishing boat that vanishes in the distance, rocked by its own breathing. A triangular sail, like a handkerchief folded diagonally, only in two, as though it has nothing to cover up or hold or to flutter wide open in farewell. I was always crazy about handkerchiefs. Not to keep anything within them, like a flower seed or chamomile plucked in the fields at sunset. Nor to not in each of their four corners, like those worn by the workers of the half-built house opposite. Or to wipe my eyes with. I've taken very good care of my eyes. And I've never worn glasses. A mere whim those handkerchiefs. Now I fold them in four, in eight, in sixteen, simply to keep my fingers busy. And now I remember, that's how I used to beat to the music when I was attending the conservatory, in a blue smock with a white collar with two blonde braids. of mine. It's a bad habit. 32, 
64, and my folks cherished great hopes for my musical talent. Well, I was telling you about the armchair. Disemboweled. Its rusty springs are showing. The stuffing... I was thinking of taking it to the furniture man next door, but where's the time, or the money, or the mood? What's one to fix first? I thought of throwing a sheet over it, but I was afraid of a white sheet in such moonlight. Here sat those who dreamt great dreams, even like you or me, and now they're resting under the earth when either rain nor moon can trouble them. Let me come with you. We shall pause a while on the top of the marble staircase of St. Nicholas, and then you shall walk down and I shall turn back retaining on my left side the warmth of your coat as it touches me by chance. And even some square-shaped lights from small windows in the poorer neighbourhoods. And this pure white mist from the moon, like a long retinue of silver swans. I'm not afraid of using such an expression because on many a spring night, formerly, I have conversed with God when he appeared to me robed in the haze and glory of such a moonlight. And many a young man, even more handsome than you, have I sacrificed to him, and thus, white and unapproachable, I turned to mist in my white flame, in the moon's whiteness, inflamed by the voracious eyes of men, by the hesitant ecstasy of youths, besieged by splendid sunburnt bodies, Vigorous limbs exercising in swimming, rowing, track, and soccer, though I pretend not to notice. Brows, lips, throat, knees, fingers, and eyes, chests and arms and thighs, as in truth, I didn't notice. You know, at times, in admiring, you forget what you're admiring, your admiration is enough. Dear God, what starry eyes! And I was lifted to an apotheosis of stars denied. Because, thus besieged, from within and without, no other road was left to me but to go upward or downward. No, it's not enough. Let me come with you. I know it's very late now. Let me come. Because, for so many years, days and nights and crimson noons, I have remained alone, unyielding, alone and immaculate, even on my marriage bed alone and immaculate, writing glorious verses on the knees of God, verses which shall survive, I assure you, as though carved on faultless marble, beyond your life or mine, much beyond. It's not enough. Let me come with you. Thank you.
last much longer. I can't bear to keep carrying it on my back. You must always be careful, very careful. To support the wall with the large buffet, to support the buffet with the carved antique table, to support the table with the chairs, to support the chairs with your hands, and to place your shoulders under the dangling beams. And the piano, like a closed black coffin. You don't dare open it. You must always be careful, very careful, for fear they'll fall. For fear you'll fall. come with you. This house, despite all its dead, does not intend to die. It insists on living with its dead, on living off its dead, on living on the certainty of its own death, and even on accommodating its dead on dilapidated beds and shelves. Let me come with you. Here, no matter how softly I walk in the evening's haze, either in my slippers or my bare feet, something or other will creak, a window pane cracks, or a mirror. Certain footsteps are heard, they're not mine. Outside, in the street, it's possible these steps cannot be heard. Repentance, they say, wears wooden clogs. And if you try to look at this or that in the mirror, behind the dust, and the cracks, you'll discern your face even more dim and more fragmented. Your face, though you wanted nothing more from life than to keep it clear and indivisible. The rim of the water glass glitters in the moonlight like a circular razor. How can I bring it to my lips? No matter how thirsty I get, how can I bring it? Do you see? I'm still in the mood for a metaphor. This is still left me. This assures me that I'm still here. Let me come with you. At times, as night is falling, I have the feeling that outside the window, the bear trainer is passing by with his old lumbering she-bear. Her disobedience to the interests of others, 
to the rings in her snout, to the needs of her teeth. Her disobedience to pain and to life with an assured alliance with death, even though with a slow death, her supreme disobedience to death with the continuity and knowledge of life that ascends with knowledge and action above her slavery. But who can play this game to the end? And the bear once more rises and plods on, obedient to her leash, to her rings, to her teeth, smiling with her torn lips at the nickels and dimes thrown her by the beautiful and unsuspecting children, beautiful precisely because they're unsuspecting, and saying thank you because the only thing that bears grown old have learned to say is thank you, thank you. Let me come with you. This house stifles me. The kitchen in particular is like the bottom of the sea. The hanging kettles glitter like the large, round eyes of improbable fish. like jellyfish, shells and seaweed catch in my hair, I can't pull them out afterwards. I can't rise to the surface again. And the tray falls noiselessly from my fingers. I collapse and watch the bubbles from my breath rising and rising, and I try to divert myself by watching them and ask myself, what would someone from above say if he saw these bubbles? That someone was drowning, perhaps, or that a diver was searching the sea's depths? And in truth, there, in the depths of drowning, I've discovered, and not a few times only, corals and pearls and treasures of shipwrecked vessels. of today and yesterday and of the future, a verification almost of eternity. A certain breathing spell, a certain smile of immortality, as they say, a happiness, an intoxication, an enthusiasm even. Corals and pearls and sapphires. Only I don't know how to give them, and yet I do give them, only I don't know if they're capable of receiving them. Nevertheless, I do give them. Let me come with you. One moment till I get my jacket. In this unsettled weather, however, we should take care of ourselves. The evenings are damp, and the moon, honestly, don't you think it intensifies the chill? Let me button your shirt. How strong your chest is. What a strong moon. The armchair. I say. And when I lift the cup from the table, whole of silence is left under it, and immediately I cover it with my hand, that I may not gaze inside. I place the cup back in its place again, and the moon is a hole in the world's skull. 
don't look inside. There's a magnetic power that attracts you. Don't look. Don't let anyone look. Listen to what I'm saying. You'll fall inside. This dizziness is beautiful and weightless. You'll fall. The moon is a marble well. Shadows and silent wings are moving. Mysterious voices. Don't you hear them? Deep, deep is the falling. Deep, deep is the rising. The airy statue is firmly knit amid its outspread wings. Deep, deep is the implacable beneficence of silence. Tremulous illuminations on other banks as you sway in your own wave. The breathing of the ocean. This vertigo is beautiful and weightless. Be careful, you'll fall. Don't look at me, for my role is to waver the exquisite vertigo. Thus, every day, heading towards evening, I have a slight headache, a few dizzy spells. Often, I run to the drugstore across the street for an aspirin. Then at times, I can't be bothered going and remain with my headache and listen to the hollow noise made by the water pipes in the walls. Or I brew some coffee and, absent-minded as always, forget and make enough for two. Who will drink the other cup? It's really amusing. I let it get cold on the windowsill, or sometimes I drink it myself, gazing from the window at the green electric light of the drugstore. Like the green light of a noiseless train coming to carry me off with my handkerchiefs, my lopsided shoes, my black bag, my poems, and with no luggage at all. Of what use would that be? Let me come with you. Ah, oh, you're going? Good night. No, I'm not coming. Good night. I'll go out myself in a little while. Thank you. Because really I must. I must get out of this exhausted house. I must see a bit of the city. No, no, not the moon. The city with its calloused hands. The city of the wage earner. The city that swears on its bread and its fists the city that can bear us all on its back with our trivialities, our vices, our hates, with our ambition, our ignorance, our old age, to hear the large strides of the city, that I may no longer hear your own footsteps, nor the footsteps of God, not even my footsteps. sober and 
say the decadence of an age. Thus, thoroughly calm once more, he will unbutton his shirt again and continue on his way. As for the woman in black, I don't know whether or not she finally went out of the house. The moonlight glitters once more, and in the corners of the room, a shadow stiffens and grows tense out of an unbearable repentance, out of rage almost. Not so much against life as against a confession that was quite futile. 